Thank you, first of all, to Andy Agnes for your very warm welcome tonight. And I'd like to extend my acknowledgement to your family and your fellow traditional owners from this country and also congratulate you and the ANU in respect to coming to your successful discussions about um, renaming Union Court to Cambry. Um, and as the VC has said, to recognise and embed our Indigenous story in the heart of the UN, UN, ANU campus. <coughs> Thank you, Brian, for that welcome. Um, and I'd like to also acknowledge, even those not here, Professor Gareth Evans, the ANU Chancellor, um, and the uh, other executive members, so Professor Marnie Parkinson and um, uh, Margaret Harding, and uh, also uh, Richard Baker, who uh, I uh, have made me welcome into uh, the ANU as, uh, as part of uh, my role of the ANU Council. Can I also, also thank Karen Mundine as uh, the co-host and sponsor of this lecture um, for your words. Um, I'd like to uh, also acknowledge the, um, uh, all of the respective dignitaries who might be here tonight uh, and your repre or representatives who've taken the time to come. And I also take, thank the continuing and generous support of all the sponsors to the ANU. I do want to make special mention of uh, Mick, Professor Mick Dodson, my esteemed Yaru countryman, and um, it's not going to turn, turn into a Yaru love fest here tonight, but, there's, but um, uh, who heads up the ANU Centre for Indigenous Studies, which hosts this lecture. Uh, and as Mick indicated, he'll be leaving the position soon. Um, and, I'd, um, and I think very shortly, and I'd like to thank Mick uh, for enriching this university and our nation with his commitment to Indigenous scholarship and maintaining his high standard of advocacy and his continuing contribution to public discourse. I also acknowledge uh, Dr. Anne Martin, the Director of the Jabal, uh, Jabal Indigenous Higher Education Centre and all of the Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander students and scholars. Can I also acknowledge my uh, Chair for Nyamaburu Yarra, Deborah Pigram, who's um, here with us tonight as well. Um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Senator Pat Dodson, my another, that's why I talked about the Yaru thing, but uh, another fellow Yaru countryman, senior countryman, uh, who gave the inaugural um, reconciliation lecture in 2004 and then again in 2013. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Ryan and the others, for accommodating. This is supposed to have happened last year in December, but uh, unfortunately, there was a death of a very close to family relation. and. Um, sought to have this postponed and uh, Brian uh, graciously was able to accommodate me in, in putting the state back further to this, so thank you for that. Um, and I'm very privileged to, to be able to deliver this annual uh, reconciliation lecture uh, against uh, much more esteemed uh, people before me uh, who've delivered this. But I have to say from the outset that I believe that the once laudable concept of reconciliation whose initial objective was to heal the wounds of our nation's historic injustices and include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in a modern Australia under the terms of an agreed political settlement no longer exists. I believe that reconciliation has lost its moral and political gravitas. While I know and I believe that sections of the general community remain extremely committed uh, to the concept and the aspirations of reconciliation, and not only remain committed to those things, but work very, very hard in that area. It has become a nebulous and meaningless term and used by anyone as a throwaway concept to apply their interpretation about the relationship between Aboriginal people and the Australian state. It has become part of the lazy dialogue concerning Indigenous people, dominated by symbolism which has little connection with the realities of people's lives. Personally, I find the first few weeks of the year an unsettling period with an obsessive focus on Australia Day or Invasion Day or Survival Day. And then as soon as we get past the 26th of January, the national dialogue becomes immersed in the anniversary of Mr Rudd's historic apology on behalf of the Australian nation to the stolen generation. And sadly, the worthy national milestone is diminished by the Prime Minister's annual report to the National Parliament, which highlights the nation's collective failure to close the appalling socio-economic gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. 
throw in recognition of Indigenous peoples in the Constitution and the potential severing of constitutional links to the British monarch, and what we have in this country is a facile dialogue of disconnected symbols which are supposed to define Australian nationhood. Juxtaposed with the focus on symbolism and rhetoric about doing better to close the gap is the unacceptable reality of increasing imprisonment rates, appalling health outcomes, homelessness and overcrowded houses, family and community violence concerning Aboriginal people. The list of benchmarks which describes the crisis confronting many Indigenous peoples, particularly in remote Australia, but not only in remote Australia, is depressingly familiar. A key element of this national tragedy is that governments have normalised what should be an unacceptable failure of Australian nationhood. Symbolic and political incrementalism is cruel as it raises expectations and hope and distracts from the truth that can erode the culture and the soul of peoples and their communities. Australia has reached a point in its history where we should have a genuine dialogue about establishing a realistic national approach to end the tragedy of Indigenous peoples' marginalisation. The fact is that we as a nation will never close the gaps if, continue, if governments continue their current policies and practices. We, as the first peoples of this nation, have enough experience with governments over many lifetimes to understand that this is not possible. Only Indigenous peoples can close the gap, but that means fundamentally changing the relationship between the Australian nation, that the relationship that it has with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We do need to own our own risk, and that any dramatic shift and change in our circumstances for the better of our children and our families can only come from our own determination, our own discipline, commitment and leadership at an individual and collective level in driving the required change. Then we can argue for renewed commitment to reconciliation by joining the fundamental symbols of our nationhood as a grand national political settlement. The idea of a national framework agreement or treaty which supports localised agreements incorporating traditional owners or native title holders, the Commonwealth and the state governments, local governments and industry, and community stakeholders should supersede the current dysfunctional federalism arrangement, which we all know is failing. A localised development approach would simply extend the existing Indigenous land use agreements, which are increasingly embedded in land administration arrangements under the Native Title Act, except that it would be anchored in constitutional recognition. A political settlement approach to Indigenous constitutional recognition should be fundamentally tied to a future independent Australian Republic. The last time there was a serious debate about Australian becoming, Australia becoming a republic was almost 20 years ago and culminated in the 99 constitutional referendum, which we all know was rejected um, and the case, of course, again, was hijacked by base politics. But back then there was no attempt by those advocating for republic to make the connection between Indigenous rights and reconciliation. They simply wanted to replace the British sovereign as head of state with someone appointed by a list at least two thirds of the national parliament under their banner. In other words, a resident for president. Yet in light of the High Court's determination of native title in Mabo and Wick and the central matter of the British government's intent concerning the recognition of Indigenous rights, the question to me and to many Indigenous people was, how could the political push to change Australia's constitution by severing the connections with the British Crown not involve Indigenous peoples? Aboriginal people have an enriched understanding of symbols, historic traditions and the law. The connection between the current British monarch and her fourth great-grandfather, King George III, are seamlessly pierced together as one symbolic, temporal entity of profound significance to Aboriginal people. Coinciding with the 1998 Constitutional Convention in Canberra, uh, we held our, uh, Aboriginal people held our own Constitutional Convention in the Kimberley near Derby, which resolved to send a delegation to London to tell the British monarch 
that she should not leave her job until the unfinished business of achieving Indigenous consent to British occupation and settlement was properly addressed. So we were all sitting down in the red dirt one night and uh, a very senior old man got up and said in his very clear and straight English, you better got to go see that old girl overseas. <laughs> and I said, um, why should we do that? And he said, because you call him by, they call him by his name wrong way here. And so what he was talking about fundamentally was that the only time that we um, come in touch or know um, the Queen or the monarch is when we're getting arrested by the police, getting arrested by, and we're being put in jail by the screws. But it also reflected on the fact that the uh, instructions on settlement in Australia in relation to the to treat with the natives was something that yet had not been um, adhered to. In, instead, as we know through history, the repugnant notion of terra nullius um, forged the beginning of our relationships. So actually, I took him up on that, and I did write a letter to that very wonderful Australian man, Sir William Dean, who was the Governor General at that time, and sought his advice. And uh, I just happened to be one day standing out at Fitzroy Crossing um, at the, when those uh, brick, as they call them, mobile phones, were just coming into place, and I got this call, and was was um, uh, Sir William Dean on the other end of the line, um, and, he, and he said, uh, I've received your letter. And I said, oh, Sir William, he said, uh, Bill will be fine. And um, he said, oh, what, what do you want to go and see the Queen for? And I said, oh, well, the, our senior people here feel that um, um, we ought to pay our respects to her and to, um, given the context of the current debate, we were not involved in the Republic debate, <clears throat> it would be useful for, for, the, for Her Majesty to be able to hear, the opinion, hear our voice directly. So he said, OK, that's fine. So he said, here's the number. You can call Buckingham Palace. So there's the Queen's private secretary is waiting to hear from you. So sure enough, I rang Fitzroy Crossing and I got through to Buckingham Palace and he said, hello. <laughs> hello. Well, I can't do a very posh pommy accent, but it's like, you know, Sir Robert Divin. And uh, anyway, he said, yes, well, I've been expecting your call. So um, from there, we then organised, and 18 months later, an Australian delegation, Indigenous delegation, had an audience with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II at Buckingham Palace and told her that Britain had a historic responsibility to the Indigenous people of Australia, which was central to reconciliation. And it was interesting at that time because we also paid a visit to Ireland, and that was uh, during the period of the kind of settlement in Northern Ireland, and uh, uh, a very strong view. Um, we visited Northern Ireland uh, on invitation, and um, that, and Ireland being the first colony and us being the last, that there, there hadn't been the kind of reconciliation achieved between the British monarch and those countries. Um, and quite interesting that there were very similar kind of sentiments in um, sections of the Irish community about reconciling with the British Crown. So, um, and the delegation was led by Patrick Dodson and the, the late Gutchil Jakura, chairman of ATSIC, previous chairman of ATSIC, um, Lowitjo Donoghue, um, Professor Marcy Langton and myself. Unfortunately, Galleroy Unipigi was too, too sick to travel at that time and had to withdraw. But we presented the Queen with a written statement outlining the unresolved relationship between Britain and the Indigenous people of Australia, which one day we hope will be made public. But we also um, sought advice when we went over there in terms of Australia become a republic and whether or not that would abrogate the, under international law, the legal responsibility um, to um, to us as the First Nation peoples in this country, um, if we were to proceed to become a republic, was a very interesting question. And there's a, a mixed kind of, as you would expect with lawyers, a mixed kind of response as to the strength of our case. But there were some very strong opinions suggesting that uh, there was a, if not a legal, then a very strong moral and ethical responsibility. The day we met the Queen, we learnt that two great Australian lawmen had passed away. One was Kenny Ubaguma, a senior Wawara man who lived in the Maunjung community near Derby and who had been a leading philosophical voice in the Kimberley Aboriginal Constitutional Convention which prompted the delegation to visit Buckingham Palace. The other was Ron Caston QC, the great friend of Indigenous people, Torres Strait Island people, 
and the lawyer who prosecuted the Mabo case on behalf of Eddie Mabo and the Murray Islanders. We knew Ron was undergoing a life-threatening oper operation to address a long-standing health problem, but his death came as a terrible shock. As a lawyer, a political advisor and friend, Ron was irreplaceable. Ron had become concerned about the rights of the Tibetan people after the exile of the Dalai Lama from Tibet, and along with a number of his young legal colleagues, spent a number of months living with the Dalai Lama and made a true and lifelong friendship with His Holiness. Before we left for London, Ron had arranged for Patrick and me to meet His Holiness in Milan, Italy, which we planned to do on our return journey. It was an emotional meeting for us, but the Dalai Lama infused in us, infused us with a sense that despite whatever sadness and loss we felt with losing Ron, life should always be hopeful. The Dalai Lama, as we all know, have witnessed, we have all witnessed an extraordinary, insightful and profound thinker. He has visited Australia many times and told us that we should feel positive about the potential of our nation. He said Australia is a young nation. It's not scarred by civil wars, territorial rule and mass impoverishment. Australia, he said, has the potential to transcend its colonial, colonial and blood-strained birth and reconcile its history to become a beacon of light to the world. And when I feel grounded by Australia's petty politics of division, the wedge politics and dog whistling that appears to the, appeals to the worst of Australia, and when I feel like I'm drowning in the murky swamp of mediocrity and incrementalism, I often think of the Dalai Lama's inspirational vision of what Australia could be. I seriously believe that the Australian nation is far better than the political system which represents us. And where there is a groundswell of goodness in mainstream Australia, the political system can change. We are not America, we are, as the Dalai Lama says, a nation with the potential to be a beacon of light for a troubled world. This is not a naive romantic position because I believe uh, I have had, uh, um, fortunate to have many great mentors in my life who have inspired me to think this way. A profound influence on my thinking was Nugget Coombs. As many of you would know, Nugget was a great intellectual and political champion for the establishment of the ANU and was this university's chairman between 1968 and 1976. In his later life, he became a wonderful friend and visited the Kimberley regularly and on occasions when I got to Colin Canberra and on occasion stayed, stayed with me at my place. Those of you who had the pleasure of spending time with Nugget would know that he was a compelling storyteller, particularly when lubricated with a glass of red wine. We would regularly talk well into the night and he would regale me with extraordinary accounts of what this nation was capable of. Central to his belief was that governments must lead. Nugget would explain that good government leadership involved sound policies and the capacity to communicate to the mob that these policies were good for individuals, for families and the nation. His love and dedication to his country was based on his belief in Australia's potential to be the most humane nation on earth. Australians, he would say, were not grounded down by enmity, fear and class divisions. People had come from all over the world to make Australia home and to seek a better life. Australia had attracted the best of global humanity in terms of people possessing the values of empathy, inclusion and enterprise. For Nugget, reconciling the injustice with Australia's first peoples was fundamental to Australia reaching its true potential. He was a true believer in a vision for Australia to be infused with the values and knowledges of Indigenous people so that we could be an inclusive and creative post-colonial nation like no other. And in my mind, Nugget was one of the greatest non-Indigenous champions of reconciliation we could imagine. And I think Mick coined the phrase, um, that very senior old white elder. His belief in Australia's potential to include Indigenous people in the fabric of Australian nationhood was based on his intimate knowledge of nation building as the person put in charge of post-war reconstruction by Prime Minister Ben Chifley and transformed into the modern nation we have become. He authored and oversaw the implementation of the famous white paper on employment. Manufacturing industries were created supported by clever, targeted fiscal measures. 
The education and training system was modernised and universities were built. As Nugget would say, when governments lead, the creative, resilient enterprise of the Australian people could be mobilised. And long after his death, he continues to inspire me. If Nugget Coombs was the commander in chief of Australia's economic development policy, as he was for decades following the Second World War, we would have an audience with someone capable of advising and motivating government into action. People will often say, as a counter to Nugget Coombs' vision, that Australia is innately conservative and that change can only happen incrementally and in biteable chunks. Be careful not to scare the horses is a common Australian expression that embeds inertia and incrementalism. But that, perhaps that's why the great Gullaroy Yunupinga told me years ago that beware when governments tell you there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's a bureaucrat with a torch running backwards. <laughs> I know conservative Australia. I come from conservative Australia. And I have dealt with what some would describe as the hard right of rural Australian political conservatives. I reject the proposition that conservative politics holds back the potential for Australia to embrace Indigenous peoples in our nation's constitution and institutional fabric. I do not accept that Aboriginal people and our non-Indigenous supporters should be impeded in our advocacy and thinking because we think the Conservatives won't like us. In 1997 and the early part of 1998, I participated alongside a range of national Indigenous leaders in discussions with Conservative politicians from both the Liberal and National parties and rural political advocates about negotiating a treaty between Indigenous peoples and the Australian nation. The treaty was designed to supersede the Native Title Act and the various Indigenous and land and heritage laws across the federal jurisdictions and bring about a lasting political settlement to resolve past injustices and continuing Indigenous grievances. It was proposed that the treaty negotiation would also be accompanied by a comprehensive investment in documenting Australia's history, which was designed to put an end to the destructive history wars and the abuse of history as the weapon in wedge politics. The context of these discussions was the rise of one nation and the very real threat by the then Prime Minister John Howard to call a double dissolution general election on the Wick Amendments to the Native Title Act. There was, of course, a serious motivation of self-preservation on the part of the Conservatives. There was nothing that Pauline Hanson would have, would have loved more than to have a general election based on Indigenous rights. The National Party felt seriously threatened that they would be wiped out. The mining industry, which was also involved in discussions, felt that their interests were better served by John Howard's parliamentary brinkmanship and withdrew from the process. As we know, Senator Harradine gave John Howard the vote he needed to pass the WIC 10-point plan bill. Yet despite this, the dialogue continued for a couple of years in general exploration by Indigenous leaders and Conservative political leaders about negotiating a treaty. That experience convinced me that Conservative Australia is not opposed to a grand settlement of reconciliation. In fact, I believe that many Conservative Australians of considered opinion are more thoughtful and committed about reconciling Australia than many of those who would describe themselves as belonging to the progressive sides of Australian politics. Ron Caston was passionately involved and helped to build a bridge between Conservative interests and Indigenous leaders as we saw the pathway towards a negotiated treaty. We needed to believe that these discussions went beyond the expediency of Australian party political self-interest. Ron's untimely death in late 1999 reminded us all of the precious quality of leadership and how certain people of grandeur can influence history. Sadly, the dialogue of the treaty between Indigenous leaders and the Conservative political interests waned after Ron left us. In recent months, I have thought deeply about the quality of leadership of people like Nugget Coombs, Ron Caston and the Dalai Lama. Last year, 55, 50 years, after more than nine in 10 Australians voted to raise those appalling provisions in our nation's constitution, that Indigenous peoples should not be counted the national census and that our people should be expressly excluded from section 51, subsection 26, giving the Commonwealth power to make laws for any race, we have needed national leadership 
more than ever. When 250 representatives of the Indigenous nations from throughout Australia met at Uluru on the very anniversary of the 67 referendum to produce a statement that reached out to the hearts of all Australians, we sought the considered response from Australia's political leadership. The poetic words in the Uluru Statement were clear, evocative and unifying. It called for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. It called for the establishment of the Makarata Commission to supervise the process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In the days following the Uluru Statement, I wondered how the great Australian nation building political leaders who I have encountered Gough Whitlam, Malcolm Fraser, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating would have responded. I am sure that each of them would have captured the historic moment and woven it into the fabric of our nation. Instead, we got deafening silence and platitudes of delay. And then months later, we, the Indigenous people of the nation as a whole, learnt that the government had rejected the whole constitutional recognition process. Contrary to what our current Prime Minister says, our national constitution does not enshrine the principles, principles of equality of citizenship. The history of the Australian constitution is not inclusive. It is, in fact, opposite. Our nation was born with the constitutional powers to exclude Asians and non-white people and to enable the continued genocide of Indigenous people by ensuring that the Commonwealth had no responsibility for a people who were not considered worthy of being counted in the national census. That is what the original race powers was all about. Reconciling that history and amending the constitution to enshrine the principles of equality of citizenship is what indigenous peoples have fought for all along. They are more than just words and legal powers. The constitution defines the values of a nation. My mother is Aboriginal and my father is Chinese. I know what I'm talking about when it comes to the values of exclusion and racism, values which should not be part of modern Australia. Sometimes we turn to humour to deal with this bleak situation. My late friend and comrade Indigenous leader Tracker Tilmart once rang me out of the blue one night and said to me, Yui, that's Australian for Peter Yu, um, <laughs> I feel sorry for you, mate. And I said, why is that, Track? He said, because that red-haired woman hates you twice. <laughs> but on a serious note, <laughs> but on a serious note, if we're going to transcend the nation's bloodstained history of violent dispossession and exclusions of indigenous peoples and become, as the Dalai Lama has said, a beacon of light to the world, we must embark on a national commitment to learn about our history. This is what the Uluru Statement has called for as a fundamental aspect of reconciliation and treaty making. And as I wind up, I'd like to refer to some aspects of the ANU uh, Reconciliation Action Plan, but also outline what I think could be the responsibility of ANU in this national commitment for renewed reconciliation of historical understanding and truth-telling. Nugget Coombe's vision for this university was to be a nation-building learning institution and a leader in public discussion and policy formulation of big ideas. Reconciling tens of thousands of years of indigenous occupation and ownership of Australia, lands and waters with European colonisation and settlement since 1788 is a big idea which, is which this university is ideally placed to make a significant contribution. The new Australian National University Reconciliation Plan was launched in January this year on the 31st, and the states of the ANU will renew, build on its history of engagement and seek a new partnership with Indigenous, Indigenous Australia. It is intended to set new benchmarks for initiatives that are to be implemented at a university-wide level and to create a historic, holistic approach to advancing reconciliation. ANU has invested in research and learning with an Indigenous focus and build an organisational architecture which has the capacity to reach out to every corner of our nation to join with Indigenous communities and others to transform learning and knowledge sharing. While there are important strategies designed in, in the RAP to target greater equity and opportunity for Indigenous students, scholars and administrators, it is also pleasing to note 
and acknowledge that the RAP is not limited to a narrow Indigenous-specific outcome only, but rather more seriously to fill its responsibility as a national university by putting the national back in the end of ANU. The strategic and executive plan acknowledges that it is not only the question of university experience and academic excellence important for First Peoples, but how the nature of that experience and achievement can be recognised and leveraged in important other critical areas for the benefit of the nation. Areas like the Societal Transformation Initiative and the proposed Public Policy and Societal Impact Hub, areas of research, innovation and public policy development to set the agenda in national and international discourse about ourselves, our region and our future together. An important example of that, um, of course, is the recently announced initiative by the ANU, ANU in partnership with the federal Indigenous politicians, the Honourable Ken White and Senators Linda Burney, Patrick Dodson and Melendary McCarthy and Professor McDodson to host the first Nations Governance Forums to be held in July this year. Coming off the back of the recent rejection of the Uluru Statement by the government and seemingly at this stage no further movement on the proposed constitutional recognition, the ANU will host this major forum to consider First Nations governance reform in Australia and lessons learned from other jurisdictions globally at Old Parliament House. This is the beginning of a new engagement with the First People of this nation in a critical public policy leadership and discourse. But this university is capable of so much more if it could harness its potential to collaborate and use its resources more efficiently to reach out to partner Indigenous communities and particularly those of us across Northern Australia. And Brian will have heard this before and other members about my um, going on about Northern Australia. I think it's particularly relevant at this time in our history with the considerable attention on the development of no Northern developments and the growing discourse of our current and future relationship with China, Asia and India this is an opportunity for the ANU to grow its investment in Northern First Peoples communities. Demographically, as First Peoples of the North, we still remain the permanent population with significant land, water and cultural assets. Our cultural assets marginally acknowledged and our physical assets underdeveloped. As First Peoples of Northern Australia lies in our capacity to economically engage with our nor Northern neighbours. For some time, I have harboured the idea about fusing the collective endeavour and passions of local Indigenous communities, universities, schools and local governments to document oral histories of the First Peoples and settler communities in this country, and to combine those stories with archival source to build a bank of knowledge that would be an uncontested truth. I imagine the process itself of collecting and exploring local histories, which could, which could come together as a mosaic of national understanding and wisdom, would be reconciliation in practice. I believe the ANU has the capacity and gravitas to lead this initiative. It would be ANU's way of responding to the Uluru Statement and meeting the university's high commitment to reconciliation. The idea that we could have a national history and reconciliation centre to become a key source of the energy for the beacon to shine its light on the future, path, on the future pathway for the maturation of this nation through its key role in academic excellence and research and innovation national policy development areas. Such an endeavour would do more than anything I could imagine to honour the legacy of the great Nugget Coombs. Without a deep and meaningful understanding of, our, of this nation's history, I don't believe we will achieve national reconciliation. There simply will not be the appetite of passion for substantial change. The continuing trickle-down effect of political symbolism and uncreative policies is akin to the impact of trickle-down economics. It's an outdated model, model in a technologically modern society that has minimal effect on the real lives of ordinary Australians on the ground. I am an optimist by nature, and I know Australia is a better nation than the political system that represents us. The failure of success in national governments and parliaments to forge pathways to recognise Indigenous people of the nation's constitution is a failure of Australia's body politic. Constitutional recognition should not be viewed as another contentious issue, accompanied by political cajoling and manoeuvring, to be ticked along the linear trajectory of Australian nation building. It should be understood as fundamental to our moral and ethical national character. We at the end will have to depend on the goodwill 
the fairness and the continuing commitment of the broader Australian community with people like yourselves. Without a reconciled Australia, we will remain destined to remain trapped in its colonial heritage of unfinished pictures. Galia, thank you very much. Well, it's our 2017, really, <laughs> uh, reconciliation lecture. Um, I won't be there to decide whether we have two of these lectures this year, but um, technically it's last year's lecture. <laughs> uh, Peter's happy to take a few questions now, but the, there are some um, people walking around with mics, some NGOS staff, if anybody's got a question. Or perhaps an answer. <laughs> that would be better. <laughs> yes. Uh, Ben's got a mic, he's coming up behind you. Thank you, Peter, for that passionate, inspired, and, and eloquent and reasoned address. So I, I'm sure I speak for us all in saying that. What I want to do is take you back for a moment to the remarks you made about the document that you presented to Her Majesty in Britain, uh, because it seems to me that this document in itself is a, a shining beacon, and I was deeply troubled by your remark that it will be seen by virtually no one. Uh, the Royal Archives, of course, are closed, except at the discretion of the Crown. Unlike our national archives, there is no way the Australian public could gain access to such a document, and yet its stature, its importance, is surely immense. Uh, can you tell us any more of that? Um. My filing system is not the best in the world, Bruce, but, um, <laughs> but um, certainly um, the nature of the uh, protocol um, um, as part of the conditions in terms of the, as you would expect, um, uh, was a confidential meeting, was not a public meeting, um, and uh, certainly we were coached in that regard. Um, but I think... Um, you can imagine that um, the contents of that document quite clearly uh, were quite strident in terms of the uh, position um, of First, the First Nation peoples of this country, uh, in terms of the unresolved relationship, um, both domestically but also its, its connection uh, to uh, the monarch in terms of the original instructions to George III. Um, and the fact that, um, but you know, I don't think it, 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 it if I can rec recollect, it doesn't dwell in the nature of the kind of historical rhetoric so much to say that the, what the opportunity presents itself, um, particularly in terms of the um, opportunity that it had Australia um, gone down the path of the Republic at that stage, what, um, uh, and I guess it's key objective was not only to state the facts as we were concerned, but also there was a, there was a Choggle meeting in um, South Africa, I think, after that, where the Queen had to go and meet John Howard. We weren't very popular when he got back, of course, but didn't get any job offers from the federal government. But, um, but um, the, um, well, we do believe that um, um, we, we'd like to believe, we think that perhaps there were a couple of words said in relation to the concern that we had expressed it as part of the delegation visit. So. But I, I agree with you, I can't um, in any way, um, you know, in, in real terms, I'd have to follow that up in terms of who might have a copy of it. Um, we have a question up here. Uh, thank you for your speech, like awesomeness. Um, I, my question concerns the what can be done here in Australia to ensure that a treaty between indigenous peoples and the state does not become the colonial weapon of war that was used against my ancestors in the United States and Canada? Well, I think we have a lot to learn. I think uh, notwithstanding the disadvantage of not having a foundational kind of document uh, uh, establishing any protocol or structure to the relationship, um, um, if, if one was to be the eternal optimist, you'd say we would be certainly looking towards um, the example of the US and Canada in terms of what not to do. Uh, 
Um, I think that um, uh, that's a very hard question, but I think that's a, it's a challenge for us in our creative thinking uh, as to how we might um, ensure that there was the security. I think um, the, the fundamental uh, truth of the, the notwithstanding all the um, blemishes of the Native Title Act, but um, for instance, um, you know, we have um, currently in continuing existence in terms of the land assets, certainly if I, I know Northern Australia more, but say more than 80% of the land has a direct Aboriginal interest, direct or indirect. Um, we, uh, uh, that is also on a legal basis in terms of anybody wanting to, uh, the Act provides that uh, any level of activity proposed on lands will require some form of um, uh, agreement. And that's the basis of my dis discussion, that those, it's, it's not too hard to imagine those agreements can turn into local uh, treaties. I think, um, I think that uh, it gives us great strength that we do have uh, this fundamental uh, legal position obtained through the Native Title Act, through Mabo Decision Native Title Act. It's not perfect, um, but we do have a basis, I think, of strength. Um, and the reality is the demographics quite clearly point towards that we continue to be, uh, remain, at least in the north, the permanent population. People are born and die in that area. Um, in the more populated kind of areas in the south, I think the same opportunity exists in terms of elevating the nature of these agreements into local and regional treaties. Um, there's a, the, there's a, a, a kind of, a lot of that is going to depend upon the, the nature of the goodwill of the, of the government and the strength and unity of purpose of the Aboriginal community, but there are no guarantees. Uh, I'm not an expert on, by the way, on US or Canada treaty making, but it's something that we have to learn from. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, one here. This will be our final question. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you, Uncle Peter, for your um, for your lecture. Um, with the kind of ever changing political uh, status in Australia and the Prime Minister's growing bundle of issues um, that exist on the Hill, um, and more recent ones continually changing. How do we kind of get through the cloud of rubbish that's happening uh, on Capitol Hill and refocus the, the national dialogue around Indigenous issues? Uh, and what message do you have for the young Indigenous student at ANU who, who looks to have uh, some level of influence in the political dialogue moving forward uh, when even now, with some of the greatest leaders that we've ever had, like yourself, um, Professor Dodson and others in the, on the Hill, uh, struggling to influence the, the public uh, kind of policy. Um, in response to your first part about getting through all that muddle, I'd say with great difficulty, but um, I, um, I think part of my uh, appeal in, in, in the delivery tonight was for us as Aboriginal people to consciously consider our positions. When I talk about only our own, our own risk, um, we, we have to understand what it takes uh, to be able to challenge the kind of the rhetoric that we can get caught up in significantly in terms of, we have to be confident about our, and, and we, about our, the sustaining the cultural the customary practices and values and the integrity of that. We, 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 we know that we are capable of doing that. That's our business. We have to be able to understand that the, the current codependency on uh, public sector investment um, is very limited in, in its capacity to deliver the independence or the close thing gap, as I've said. We have to make those determinations ourselves as individuals and so that uh, uh, we need to challenge rhetoric. We need to look at the reality of our circumstance. We live, the relativity of change, as we know, in, in this, the fourth industrial revolution, and the most, um, with technology, that the arguments are not the same, and the, and the base starting points have to shift dramatically in a more sophisticated, I mean that in a, in a good way, a more, a more sophisticated way, uh, to harness the talents of our leadership. And I think the, uh, 
I have great faith in young average people like yourself, Dwayne, and others, others who are coming up, who are... The balance is to do the best you can. Education is fundamentally the great solution finder that we have to have. We have to have our children properly educated. But we also struggle, on the other hand, if we have, in, in the Kimberleys, 25% of uh, kids who are born with FASD that are now you know, making up the 42% population of the state prison system and recidivism levels. Because if we don't, if you, if you see that in terms of relativity, then the growth of the, the crop of the young people who are coming through, who are going to be successful, who are going to be emerge into the kind of Australian middle class and, and, and attain success and achieve their successes and well-deserved successes they should. Um, that's why I'm saying the gap doesn't, is not closing because the, the, the fundamentally the other half of that is that we, we haven't reached anywhere near our capacity to deliver a greater sense of uh, benefit outcome for those kids and those people. So we have to be um, honest with ourselves about this, uh, who we are in the 21st century, who we are as first people in the 21st century, whether it's in our own cultural groups or whether we, as a collective, uh, on a national level. Um, we need to be honest with ourselves and, and say that... Um, why aren't we achieving the same level of attraction um, to equal the amount of input um, to the results that are not coming out? Um, so I, I, um, it's an honest relationship. It's not really, it's a, it's a new professional relationship based on mutual respect and endeavour and enterprise, um, but not withstanding or being confident in our culture, in our language, and our law. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think that's... Um, well, thank you very much, um, Peter. Um, okay, I'll, I'll call you back. Um, <clears throat> firstly, I've got to do a few thanks, and then I'm going to invite Peter and uh, Brian back up here. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out tonight to, uh, uh, to hear this lecture. Uh, every year it seems to get better and better. Um, and um, much of it's due to responses uh, like the people here tonight, who I think are genuinely wanting to see uh, some movement on closing the gap uh, through reconciliation. I'd like to thank the diplomatic community uh, for joining us tonight. Um, we want to continue this conversation on reconciliation uh, with you. Uh, we can no longer stand alone in Australia uh, on these crucial um, issues. Thank you to the ANU um, VIP SCARPA events team. Um, we could have never pulled off such an event um, without uh, your support, and um, we very much appreciate your assistance. I'm uh, also very grateful to the ANU Strategic Leadership Team and the ANU Executives, the Deans, Directors and Indigenous Leaders. Um, thank you for your um, continued support. The CHOP uh, a cappella singers, thank you for sharing uh, that song with us. Um, there is power in, in songs, um, and I think the song you chose to, to sing today, uh, tonight, uh, perhaps could become the theme song for reconciliation. Because uh, as you know, we must uh, all lean on each other. To our ANU donors um, relations team, and to our donors, um, we cannot thank you enough for connecting us with people who wish to support the work we do, um, and um, by that you're changing lives uh, in our world. Reconciliation Australia, uh, you're here with your expertise and supporting and guiding us every step of the way. Thank you so much. And I'm very, very proud of uh, my NCIS team. <laughs> 
who have worked very hard to put out, um, put together such an event. Uh, and our special thanks to our HDR scholars who have been volunteering tonight, <coughs> and also the Australian Indigenous Governance Institute, who's uh, housed in our building. Um, thank you uh, to their staff who've also been working with us tonight. And finally, Peter, Peter, Peter. What a talk you gave tonight. Um, it's restored some fire to my belly, I can tell you. Um, and um, um, I think we might go back to our offices and our homes um, and continue the fight. Because um, we can't go back and be business as usual. Something's got to and has to change. I think you, your words have moved us all. Um, and it takes a lot of courage to address things uh, that many people choose to avoid, too many Australians choose to avoid. Um, you are certainly doing us proud, um, being on the ANU Council, and thank you for your tenacity, your consistency, and your call for advocacy. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Um, to inspire the next generations uh, to come. Thank you, Peter. Um, Yui for the first president of Australia, I think. <laughs>